to get our friends that watch us online. Y'all ready to do some trivia? Yes. Yeah. All right. I worked really hard this week to get trivia questions that y'all would be able to answer quickly. Let's see what the first one is. Which Israelite judge sacrificed his daughter after promising to sacrifice the first thing he saw after returning home victorious from battle? Jephthah. Jephthah. Somebody said Jephthah. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah. Might as well. <laughs> and the answer is Jephthah. Give Faye a hand for knowing that. All right, next question. What was the name of the king whose 185,000 soldiers mysteriously died before they could attack Judah? I don't think mmm is an answer. <laughs> Uh, do we, wait a minute, don't go there yet, Johnny. Do we have an answer anywhere? No, nobody knows. All right, let's see the answer. Snack a rib. <laughs> that was going to be my first guess. That was going to be your first guess. Okay, well, okay, so we're one and one. We got one gun and one not gun. Next question, John. <laughs> Whose daughter did Jesus miraculously revive after she had died? Why y'all are quiet now. I know this one. No guesses? Don't tell her to be quiet. She might know. <laughs> it was Jairus' daughter. Oh. So now we have one right answer and two wrong answers. Next question. What was the name of the man who tried to buy the power of the Holy Spirit from Peter and John? Huh? I'm sure all this is in the Bible. I'm sure it's in the Bible, yes. <laughs> and the answer is Simon or Simon Magus. Yeah, these are just on the tip of your tongue. I don't think you're making this up. Now we're going to talk about tradition. You ready? John Wesley considered himself, not himself, an Arminian meaning that his understanding of sin and grace was influenced by this early 17th century Dutch theologian, and I need his first and last name. I thought you said these were going to be Oh, well, last week I knew them all, Critia. I'm hearing no answers. And there would be a clue. The reason we're asking for first and last name, you might have said Mr. Arminius. But it's Jacob Arminius is his answer. And that is a huge thing about theology. We'll talk about it sometime. But Wesleyans are, Wesley, uh, Wesleyan Christians are typically known as Arminian. Which does it's not Armenian like from Armenia. It's Ar because of Arminius. Okay, next question. Methodists and Wesleyan churches are prominent on this Pacific Island nation whose capital and largest city is Nuku, Nuku Alofa. See, Critty, they are easy. Incredibly easy. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. Somebody said Guam. I don't think so. Let's see what's next. Hawaii. Not Hawaii. <laughs> Let's have the answer, Johnny. I think you're Tonga. Oh yeah, now you got it now, right? Okay. Next question. The founder of the United now Carol if Carol Walsh was here this morning, she was in church last night. She would know this because she was an evangel evangelical United Brethren before she was Methodist. The founder of the United Brethren Church was present for the ordination of Methodist Bishop Francis Asbury. Now you actually have heard this name before. It's not totally obscure. But you probably won't know it. Coke. Okay, answer, John. It's Philip William Otterbein. Oh, him. Otterbein comes up sometimes when we talk about history about Wesley. Okay, so are y'all feeling really smart right now? No. All right, next question. The 19th century Methodist abolitionist born Isabella Balfrey was best known for her Ain't I a Woman speech. Mm -hmm. 
So if nothing else, we're learning some stuff today, right? Let's have the answer, Johnny. Is Sojourner Truth is who it was. All right, so next question. It's time for reasoning questions. These are the ones that some of y'all. So if one equals four and two equals five and three equals six, what does four equal? One. Seven. Lily says one. What do you think? Should we give her a shot at it? Seven. 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 No, somebody else says seven. Well, let me just remind you. The very first line says, if one equals four. Oh, that's true. Four does So what do you think four equals? One. You see how important it is to think through things? The answer is one. Way to go, Lily. Way to go, Lily. Good job. All right. You are new in town, and you need a haircut. Oh, Lord. There are only two barbers in town. One has an awful haircut. The, offer has, the other has a very nice haircut. Which one should you go to? The one with an awful haircut. Uh huh. And why, Brad? Because the other guy cut it. Yeah, because he cuts the good guy's hair, right? That's good, Brad. Good job. See, that's who's teaching our children right now, right over there. Right? The one with a horrible haircut. He's the, hor the, he's, only, he's the only barber who could have cut the hair of the barber with a nice haircut. I actually spell checked those, but I must have been tired. Okay, so anyway, that's our trivia for today. Y'all did excellent. Give yourself a hand. We learned something new. Philip Otterbein, you can remember that now, right? You're right. <laughs> Y'all are all funny. Well, let's start church by singing God of the Ages. As you're able, would you stand for the second? scriptures from 2 Timothy starting in, it's, uh, in the fourth chapter. As for me, I'm already being poured out as a libation and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. 
From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it be not counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack, evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks. God. God. As you're able, would you stand as we affirm our faith this morning with the affirmation of faith? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life from Amen. forward for the collection of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. Yeah. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, the God of the ages, you've been with us all the time. You've nurtured us, cultivated us, and brought us to this place. So today we give thanks for the lives we live and the lives you give us to keep living. Right now we ask you to accept our gifts and our tithes and our offerings. Take them and use them to magnify and lift up your name in this community and throughout the world. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
You may be seated. As we prepare to pray together this morning, AJ is going to lead us as we sing Him of Promise. things, I guess, a benefit from sitting in the pumpkin patch is watching our blessing box get utilized. And one of the things that I have really become aware of is that there's a few people that come up here in a car. Uh, one lady came in a car and, and unloaded a lot of stuff for us. But I think most of our people are either walking or riding bicycles. And it just kind of tells me that things are not as good for some folk as I thought they might be. And uh, I mean, I've had hard times, and I'm sure all of y'all had too, but I don't think most of us have ever ridden a bicycle up to a food box to take a hand out. And I'm so glad we have it there. And, uh, and so we just need to keep doing it. It's a thing we do, but uh, we had no idea when we started this back, like, you know, a long time ago now that it was gonna turn into what it has, but it's a great way for us to serve this community. And uh, you know, those people may never darken our doorway, but when we see them, we should invite them to come. Uh, let's pray. Gracious God, we, we give thanks for a community where we live in relative safety. We give thanks for the places we live, the food we have to eat, the beds we sleep in. And sometimes we just take it for granted, yet, Evidently, there's a lot of people that don't have that. People sleeping in cars and under bridges. And God, I know that you would have us help them, but we don't always know how. And we give thanks that we're a part of a group of churches in our connection where we reach out through UMCOR to help disadvantaged and through the Methodist Children's Home where we help kids that need that we're thankful that we have these organizations in place, but somehow, God, it seems like nothing is ever quite enough. So forgive us when we get uh, apathetic. Forgive us when we don't see the need. Forgive us when we get a little bit righteous. And help us to remember that it's the humility of understanding the gift you gave us that we do not deserve and cannot earn that gives us eternal life. So forgive us when we take the wrong path, forgive our sins of commission or omission, and hear our prayers as we pray for those friends and relatives that are hurting, maybe financially, but often is physically. God, you've encouraged us to keep being persistent and we pray for healing, for cures for dreaded diseases, for health, 
for our friends and families, in fact, for all of our human family. We turn to the scriptures that you've taught us time and time again. When all else, all else fails, love. And God, thankfully, you sent us the truest picture of love ever painted anywhere in Jesus Christ. When he showed what it was to reach across fences, cross borders, just to love no matter what. That kind of love we know as agape love, unconditional, unmerited, undeserved. So today, as we lift up our prayers, we pray for good times. We even pray for our baseball team. We also pray for our country and our community and every single person that lives and breathes in the area where we have this church, that they can be touched by the loving grace of God and somehow experience the power of the Holy Spirit and God, we do that every week as we do it right now when we pray the prayer your Son taught us, which says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to hear the scriptures this morning, we're going to sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Would you stand as we sing? <clears throat> told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven. He was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'll tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled. But all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thank Thanks you, be God. God. And you may be seated. Okay. I remember thinking some years ago, a long time ago, I guess, how holy certain people were. How I put them up, I, I remember Reverend Bennett in particular, Eugene Bennett, I, I held him up on a very high pedestal. We joked around when they called him R.B. for Reverend Bennett. 
And I thought the ground he walked on was like paved with gold. It was, Garth Bullis at that time didn't have a secretary, so the preacher would be around the church, kind of like I am here at times. And me and a bunch of guys after school, we went over to the church. Uh, well, the church didn't know, wasn't always open, so we had one day taken Reverend Bennett's keys and borrowed them long enough to go get some keys made. <laughs> So when we wanted to go hang out at the church, we could go hang out at the church, whether he was there or not. We used to think he didn't know, but I somehow figured out he knew about it because we'd be there when he got there. And we were a little strange, I guess, hanging out at the church. That's what we did after school. We'd go hang out at the church. Anyway, so we, had, we held Reverend Bennett to this very high esteem, and one day we'd go up there, and he's there. His car's there, and we can't find him. And we go looking. And he's in a little alcove on the back of the church smoking a cigar. <laughs> Shattered our picture. Now, he had never exalted himself. We had exalted him. It is silly how we can sometimes let a little thing like that distract us from who somebody is or what they are. I think this scripture is a very good scripture for us in this time, in this place, when so many people want to tell us so loudly how great they are, and they don't talk about how they're great or what they've done great or what they've done, although this guy did. He said, I give a tenth of my money. What they do is they do it by knocking the other guy like, I'm not as bad as that text. Maybe you've never done that. I sure have. Yeah, I've looked around at my behavior and stuff and said, well, mine must not be as bad as theirs because I'm not as much trouble as they were in. I only got suspended for three days from school. <laughs> and it was the last three days before Christmas. How convenient was that? But this whole idea of, of touting ourselves as better than is not just a problem between the Pharisee and the tax collector. It's going on all around us. It goes on denominationally within churches. It goes on within organizations. It even goes on in politics, believe it or not. And the problem is that we are all more like the tax collector than the Pharisee. Because we're all sinners. Yep, me too. Amen. Now the difference between us and the tax collector, I mean, and the Pharisee is, we know it. The, the tax collector knew it. The Pharisee thought he wasn't. Hmm. He thought by doing certain things, he could be exempted from the world. Oh, I give 10%. I'm not. He lists the specific things he's not. Specifically, he's not a thief, a rogue, an adulterer. Or a tax collector. You know, tax collectors in those days were usually Jewish. They were right out of the community. Or they were the collection taxes. They'd been told by the Romans, you got to collect this number. Anything else you get yours. No wonder the tax collector beat his breast and said, oh, what a sinner, because poor people, people that were hurting, he was taking more than he needed to take from them so he could live better. I think sometimes we get, I love the fact that Jesus spoke in parables because it allows us to interpret them and think about them and see where and see ourselves in the story. But the reality is there's a better odd, a better chance of the tax collector type sinners, in other words, us leading other people to Christ than there is the righteous guy that says, I'm not like you. Because the reality is we all are like the tax collector in some way or the other. We can't earn our salvation. We don't deserve our salvation. It has been given to us through Christ's unmerited grace that He gives us because He has hope for us that we can become something better than what we are on our own. Because left to our own devices, we're going to keep doing the same old thing, the same old way, with the same old people. Amen. So, out in the pumpkin patch, if you had a chance to come, 
We have a story called Spookly. Now, I'm sure Johnny read it enough times the other day he could we do it word for word. I won't be doing it word for word, but here's the deal. The gardener plants a pumpkin patch. That could be God, right? And in the pumpkin patch, most of the pumpkins are the same. Except one. And he's square. Yeah, I know pumpkins can't really think or talk, but Spookly is the square pumpkin, and he's a little distressed about it because the round pumpkins, they got it made. They can roll around, bask in the sun. Spookly just gets one side looking at the sun because he can't move. One day a storm comes along, and it blows the pumpkins around, and they bust through the fence. Three of them go out into the bay, and little Spookly, you know, this undeserved, weird pumpkin, he looks around and says, you know, there might be something I could do. And so he flips and he flops and he tips and he tops and he finally gets on his side. And then he finally rolls over and plugs the hole in the gap. And all the pumpkins hooray. They say, hooray. Can you imagine that pumpkin saying hooray? <laughs> Except the wind's still blowing and so the rest of the pumpkins now start to pile on top of spooky. And if you read the story, it cracks and crunches and thumps and blooms. Pretty soon it goes dark because he's at the bottom of this humongous pile of the good-looking pumpkins. The farmer comes out the next day, and he takes the pumpkins and puts them in the field so they'll dry out. At the bottom of the pile, right next to the broken hole of the fence, he finds this little square, bruised, almost broken up pumpkin. Do you see yourself anywhere in this story? The least likely, unprettiest, not regular pumpkin saved the day. So, the farmer, being a genius, takes spookly seeds and he sows them into the community, I mean the pumpkin patch. And the next year when those pumpkins grow, they grow, most of them square, but some of them are cubes and some are triangular and some are round and so forth. They're all colors and difference. And what's really cool is that that pumpkin patch now is diverse. It's no longer just round pumpkins with one square ones. They got some that are blue and some that are red, and some are polka dots, some are rainbow colored, and they're all shapes. So it ends this way. It says, now you know the story of Spookly. Maybe you'll tell someone too. And they'll tell someone who'll tell someone else, and then soon everyone will know you can't judge a book or a pumpkin or a church by its cover. The most unlikely solution is the solution. So if you're thinking, look, man, my life wasn't good. I have not been a good example. I'm not a Bible scholar. I haven't studied the Bible. I can't lead somebody to Christ. I can't do it. Let me tell you, the story of Spookly is our story. Because it is Jesus' hope and mine that one day you'll tell someone who will tell someone else who will tell someone else. And one day everyone will know that Jesus is our Savior. Amen. But it has to start with somebody who was really not all that useful. He was odd. He was different. I think the sinner would say, that the tax collector would say to you, he fit that bill. And I think the reality is that if we're going to bring this world into the enlightenment of the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, it's going to happen when we tell someone who tells someone else, who tells someone else, who tells someone else. That's how it got here. Twelve people told a few others. Jesus got lucky. Got to speak to 5,000 at a time. I haven't had that privilege often 
But so many times we get caught up in this thing thinking, look, it's about something that else. Let me tell you, it is about nothing else than Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Baptist friends, it's nothing else but Jesus Christ. Our Episcopalian friends, our Lutheran friends, our Pentecostal friends, it's still about Jesus Christ. And if we all realize that, then we, like that pumpkin patch, can be the most incredible country the most incredible community, the most incredible place to go because there will be so many people serving Jesus Christ, there won't be time to get caught up in being righteous and saying, I'm better than you. <coughs> My friend Peter Miller is retired now, but he said this a long time ago. He said, anytime you draw a line, there's somebody on the other side. Let me tell you what Jesus did. He disregarded lines. He disregarded borders. He disregarded fences. He disregarded the rules. Because he wanted everybody to know about his connection to the Father. He wanted everybody to know there's something more than what you see in front of you. I don't know how we communicate that other than living it. I mean, I think churches have tried for years to browbeat people into turning to Christ. Manipulate them into believing they needed to be saved. That Timothy passage sort of speaks to that. Let me tell you, you can be manipulated into it may not count. When it counts is when you on your own profess Jesus Christ as Savior. When you on your own believe that He is the eternal Spirit, He, within Him, is the Holy Spirit, the Creator. All things happen, and our eternity is going to be there. Our eternity is there, and that eternity starts now. And friends, we are blessed. We are incredibly blessed. We're blessed to be at this church. We're blessed to be in this community. We're blessed to live in this city or Deer Park or Pasadena, any part of this end of the county. Seabrook, wherever down here in this kind of niche of the county, we're blessed. We've got good, pretty good roads. We've got places to go. Most of us have a way to get there. Most of us will be able to eat today. If you can, if you're broke, don't have any food, come get a pumpkin. I mean, uh, come get a pumpkin. But come get a potato next week. We'll fix you up. But, but I, I, most of us aren't worried about that. And there is this notion that, 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 that the, the, the Pharisee would say, is more people need to be like me. He's that same guy that would stand up there and say, when I get more, I'll give you more. And he's the same guy that's pitying the guy that has a contrite and humble heart. Now, I don't know which side of the story you find yourself on. I find myself on both. There are times when I feel really righteous. And I go home, and Kathy reminds me that I'm not. <laughs> you know, there are times when I feel really victimized. When Philadelphia beats the Cowboys. <laughs> and other times. There are times when I just feel like I can't get it right, nothing happens right. You know, the darn doctors just can't give me answers. The world would love us to live in that confused place of always wondering, what's next? How's it going to work out? Why me, Lord? And what Jesus is asking us and what this scripture says and what I title this message today is, who, me? You came to save me? All the stuff I did? All the thoughts I had? All the times when I put something else first. And you still want me? And I believe He does. And I believe He wants you to. I believe that the biggest challenge we have right now is serving God the way God wants us to serve Him, not the way the world wants us to serve each other. Now, I know we're about to be at election time. You know what Jesus would say? Go vote. That's what Jesus would say. I believe Jesus would also say no to your voting poll. But I had to add that. That's a paraphrase. It wasn't in the Bible. 
The other part is, render under Caesar, what Caesar's? Participate in the community. And I really do believe, friends, if we start doing that with a wholesome and a contrite heart, not looking at our own best interest, but what's in the best for whatever it is, our school district or our city or the county or the state or the government, if we start to look at what's the best interest, not who I like more, then we can start something. John Wesley was attributed with being significantly important in the, uh, the, the enlightenment that happened back in his lifetime. You know why he was so good at it? Because he didn't pay attention to the people that had, they, the pharisaic people, he paid no attention to them. What did they do? They kicked him out of every church in England. You're not preaching our message the way we want it preached, when we want it preached. John Wesley, don't come back. You're visiting people in prison. You're feeding the hungry. You're talking to peasants. By the help of George Whitfield, he went to the fields and he found the miners who were worthless according to everybody. And he began to tell them they had value. When he built his flat preaching houses, they were really weren't called churches, the new room. When he built that, the, the poor people sat in the balcony and guess where he put the pulpit level with the balcony? He wanted to talk to the poor people. He wanted them to know they had value. And you know what happened was, over time, those people began to believe they deserved some of the same stuff the rich people did. And they went down to the churches in England and they said, we want the priest to come and give us communion. And the priest was gone. He was hanging out down with the lords in London somewhere. And they kept on. They banged on the door. They said, we want to receive communion. I want to tell you, friends, it's going to take that kind of grassroots Christian movement in this country to change it. It is not going to come from the top down. Never will, and it really never has, has it? And, you know, we can all get all mad about something and say, we've had enough. I don't want to do that. What I want to say is nobody has enough Jesus. How are we going to get out and help them get it? How are we going to show them what it's like to be people of faith? How are we going to show them? I think we did it in the pumpkin patch. I think those kids had an experience. I think we do it with the blessing box. I think we're going to be doing it with Angel Tree whenever we get those kids and we buy them gifts. But, but that's more than, more than that. Those are things we do. Those are programs. How are we going to live our lives in ways that people can begin to see that Jesus Christ really is transforming the world? Because I believe He is. And I am optimistic about the Big C Church, which is all churches. I'm optimistic about our church. I think we are in the perfect place to reach out right this minute to people, not because we want to get them to switch from the Baptist Church or the Episcopalian Church. I'm telling you, friends, there's enough people who look just like us within a mile and a half of this church to fill it to the brim. And they ain't going to church anywhere. And we can beat on their doors, and we can invite them, and they're going to say no. Or we can go out and live our lives in ways that say, wait a minute, I want some of what you've got. What do you mean? You, you've got a, a dreaded disease and, and, and you, there's no prospect and yet you're out here having a good time and helping kids in the pumpkin patch and doing other stuff because God is faithful and because I know that God will answer the prayers and God will heal me one way or the other in time. And He'll heal you too. Just maybe not what we want or the way we want. So my prayer is, friends, as we go from this place today and for the next few weeks as we do whatever we're doing around places, we're more like that tax collector beating our breast, not looking up to God, not feeling like we deserve one instance of God's love, but knowing that we've received all of it because He gave His life for us. What a gift. What power. And Jesus said, I've given it to you. And you will do greater things than I. I don't think he's talking to each one of us individually. He's talking to the church, what the church has the power to do. But we've got to be focused because if we're not careful, we can think we're better than somebody else too. Amen. 
I love it when you see these signs up sometimes. You see them around. It says, this is an imperfect church with an imperfect pastor and imperfect ministers, and we invite imperfect people to come to it. Because that's really who we are. We're all imperfect, flawed, broken. Yep. But the good news, friends, is our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is putting us back together. And He's putting us together like He wanted us to be. Where we can best fulfill the work of the kingdom. I could get excited about that. How about you? Amen. Looking at things new, having on different glasses, seeing the world through different light, instead of seeing, oh, how bad it is and how horrible it is, how wonderful it is to wake up today to weather in the 70s, no rain, no police standing on the corner, no bombs flying overhead. Let's give thanks. Let's get together and let's serve a God that has already given everything we need. All of the power. All of the love. We just have to internalize it and let it flow from us. So I'm excited. Hope you are too. Amen. About the good news of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Since we're talking so much about this wonderful Jesus guy, we're going to sing about him now. His name is wonderful. As you're able and willing, would you please stand as we close our service today with his name is wonderful.